Hello and welcome back to the Rockwood Academy. Russell, save the troll and tell us that hello at least. Thank you. All right, my name is David Flanagan, also known as Rock Code, and I'm your host for today's Rock Code Live session. Today, we're taking a look at Open Unison, a tool to bring identity management to Kubernetes. Now, guiding us today on our journey of Open Unison, da -da -da, is my friend Mark. Hey, Mark, how's it going? Good. Hey, David, how you doing? I, I am doing very, very well. I get to sit and play with some Kubernetes software. So I'm- That's uh, always a good day. I'm, I'm pretty excited. <laughs> uh, why don't you say hello and tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Sure. So my name is Mark Borshin. I am the CTO uh, and co-founder of Tremo Security um, and also the primary author of Open Unison. Um, a little bit of uh, uh, where you might have seen me around. I'm usually in like the SIGAuth, uh, or really anywhere in, in the uh, Kubernetes Slack, answering questions wherever I can. Um, I've made contributions to the Kate's documentation. Uh, I added some contributions to like the dashboard around impersonation. Um, Kiali, I've made some contributions. So I've been I've been around the community for quite some time. Uh, also, I'm going to do some shameless self promotion here. Uh, Co-author of. Uh, Kubernetes, an enterprise guide, second edition. Nice. Um, so uh, a lot of discussion of advanced Kubernetes topics. So authentication, authorization, um, global load balancing. Uh, we get into Istio and then um, uh, we actually got rid of pod security policies and replaced it with OPA Gatekeeper. Um, so a, a lot of very advanced, uh, at, at the end, we also get into uh, building out a whole automated GitOps platform, uh, which is a lot of fun. So definitely uh, would encourage you to take a look at the book on Amazon. Um, so yeah, so that's, uh, that's all about me. All right, let me, let me throw the low hanging fruit question out then by default. Sure. Is it, is it Kubernetes enterprise ready at the box? <laughs> right yeah <laughs> um <laughs> you know it it's actually a really great question because what the, the there's uh, i've always felt that there's a fundamental difference between enterprise it and um service provider it so if you if you're talking about folks like um you know uh, airbnb and netflix and all of these great businesses there you know um uh, uber you know, they, they, they scale these massive services and everything is focused on that service, right? Every, every microservice that they build, if it's Airbnb, ultimately it's getting you to book the room. Yep. You know, if it's Uber, it's getting the ride or ordering the meal. If it's Netflix, it's to watch the video. Everything is focused on that. Whereas in the uh, enterprise world, you have a thing that the IT supports, but the IT is not the end product. So if you're talking about a bank, for example, it's, you know, you have to have IT. It's incredibly important, but at the end of the day, it's there to support the business trend, you know, the, the, the money transactions. Um, you know, you talk about government agencies. We do a lot of work in, in different governments and there are different departments that have different missions and IT is there to support them. And so that ends up creating a very siloed organization. And then that siloed organization then translates down to IT. So where in some place like an Uber or, or another service provider, you have everybody's working towards that same goal. In, in most enterprises, you have silos where you as a manager are responsible for a, a thing, right? Maybe it's, maybe it's registration, maybe it's marketing, whatever that is, and you have apps that support it. But at the end of the day, your bonus, what you get paid for is based purely on what you're delivering. And so you want to minimize the amount of outside um, interference, outside risk, right? You want to own as much of that as possible. And so most enterprises, you get a, a couple of phenomena where you get a lot of replication. 
Um, you know, so like I've been I've been preaching multi-tenancy in Kubernetes since one th one three was our back. I think when our back. I think that was our back. Um, yeah, I, I had a uh, I had a booth. Tremolo had a booth at the first uh, KubeCon that was in Seattle when it still fit in a hotel uh, ballroom, you know, in, in in the lobby. And I was talking to people about multi-tenant Kubernetes, and they were looking at me like, "Are you insane? Just have another cluster," <laughs> um, you know. And and that works great when you have a lot of Kubernetes talent to manage it. Um, you know, I don't know if you're aware of this, David, but it's very hard to debug Kubernetes clusters if they break. Um, <laughs> you might have heard that once. Yeah, I've got some experience there. Just a yeah, little bit. Ah. exactly. Um, you know, setting them up is pretty easy these days, but if they break, that's where things get really hard. And most enterprises just don't have the talent. You know, the people don't have the knowledge. So be like, oh, I spun up this Kubernetes cluster and it works great. And then it breaks and it's like, okay, now what? You know, if it's managed, it's a little bit easier. Um, but, you know, so so the when you get into enterprise, you're dealing as much with silos as you are with technology. And in the Kubernetes world, that tends to uh, manifest itself in a couple of ways. One is multi-tenancy. You know, do I go with multiple clusters or do I go with, you know, many small clusters, which, you know, tends to be people's first instinct or larger, small, a smaller number of larger clusters. Um, and, you know, the, the, there's definitely been a drift towards that multi-tenancy world, especially in the last couple of years as, as the technology has improved uh, because you can provide that, you know, that, that silo. Um, and then the other thing is the, this move from um, expecting Kubernetes to always be interacted with by a CI CD pipeline. You know, in, in, in the services world, it's always, well, I don't want people interacting with clusters. Okay, well, that there is a lot of value to that, especially in the microservices world. But in the enterprise, you got a lot of monoliths. And the people who own those monoliths, if you tell them you can't log into the pod, ooh, you're, <laughs> you get to explain that one to the CIO when there's a problem. Um, so it, it, it's developing the technology in a way to deal with those silos. And that's what we spend a lot of time with in the book is what are the technologies that you need to know to properly handle these silos? Because what, what I'll often see when I go and I talk to either a government agency or a company that's getting started with even DevOps in general, not even just Kubernetes, is they have this big grandiose idea of a PaaS that they want to build. And they say, we're going to build it. And it's going to be a product. And usually consultants who are saying, we're going to build a product for you. Um, and it's going to be this product. And it's going to be, you know, choose from column A, column B, column C, and that's it. And you know, we're going to maintain and manage everything for you. And when you get into enterprise, you start running into all these little corner cases and edge cases. And all of a sudden, the team that owns this becomes the people who are the roadblock. And so they're the ones answering the question, well, why hasn't this been done yet? If I just had a VPC, I could do this. Well, we do it this way to make your life easier, but you're not making my life easier. And so then it swings to the other way. We're like, you know what? We're just going to give you an empty cluster and be done with it. And whatever happens, that's totally on you. So you get these pendulum swings back and forth. Whereas the beautiful thing about Kubernetes, and this is one of the reasons I, I've, I've always loved it. And, 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 you know, Kelsey Hightower nailed it right on the head as the way he usually does. It's a platform for building platforms. So you can go kind of that PaaS route if you really want to, or you can go the open route or you can go anywhere in between. And there's a lot of flexibility there. Um, and so that's, that's the approach we take in the book is, you know, the authentication, the authorization, um, you know, when, when we start talking about backups, you know, it's not the sexiest thing in the world, but you got to do it, right? Um, and then even when we start getting into GitOps, we start talking about, okay, well, what does multi-tenancy look like in Kubernetes? Because it ain't just Kubernetes. You know, you've got something that's storing your Git, 
right? Especially if you're talking about GitOps, you've got a GitOps controller. So you're talking usually Argo or Flux. So what does that look like in a multi-tenant situation? Um, you know, and then what are the policies that you got to think of? You know, like, uh, um, you know, change control boards. How do you do cloud native change control boards? That's fun. Or, you know, dealing with privileged access accounts. And, and so, um, so yeah, so we, we get into a lot of those very advanced enterprise topics that don't, don't always come up when, when you're reading through the blogs. Awesome. That was a lot of information there. <laughs> <laughs> and what I, what I love is that, you know, I, I haven't spent a lot of time in the enterprise environment. I, you know, I haven't worked for a bank since, what, 2012, maybe? So it was, you know, before my, my Kubernetes days, before Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of the things you were saying there kind of gave me little flashbacks. And I said, like, oh, shit, yeah, that was the thing. And like, and Is I, that I, why I saw that cold look of terror <laughs> on your face? <laughs> well, yeah, but it's, it's made me realize that I have a lot of bias in the discussions that I have these days. Because like you said, right, um, I feel from the conversations that I have and the people that I speak to at events is that the dogmatic advice these days is to have lots and lots of small clusters. But when you think about it from the enterprise perspective, like that's a lot of authentication boundaries and that's a lot of moving targets. And that's, a, I mean, even the process around handling that, I can see why they would push towards actually, no, I want large clusters because usually they have the money as well to throw at this, this kind of hardware builder data centers or even just give it all to AWS. But yeah, they would want fewer clusters because it's less for them to build process uh, and isolation around. So I never, uh, yeah, you're flipping around a lot of the bias that I had in my head just because I haven't been working with those kind of clients or those kind of people in such a long time. But it makes a lot of sense. Um, and get up multi tenancy, like for fuck's sake, like that is such a beast as well. Like, I mean, I don't even think it was recent, uh, it was very recently, I think Argo CD even supported deploying it within a single name. It still does, <laughs> like, it kind of does. Um, <laughs> One of the challenges with Argo specific, and I love Argo. Ar Argo like if, if I have a choice as to what I'm going to go with, um, and I'm actually, we might even see a little demo with Argo today. Um, I like Argo because coming from the enterprise world, I love my GUIs. Yeah. I really do. Um, <laughs> I know I'm in the minority in this land, but uh, I, I, I love a good GUI. It makes my life easier. Um, you know, we, we don't just do product. We also do operations for some of our customers. And, um, I can tell you there have been many a time where I have pulled up the Kubernetes dashboard securely on this thing and done something important and it works great. Yeah. Um, you know, so uh, I, I do like Argo. The, the issue with Argo, um, with multi-tenancy that, that people miss is Argo uses the a cluster admin service account for all of its synchronization. And so uh, if you get, if, if you don't predefine in Argo's RBAC or in the project, which objects can be synced, you could check in like a um, resource quota update as an example, and yep. Argo will sync it because yeah. there's no RBAC there. Well, these um, GitOps operators, like, they're root in the cluster. I mean, the only difference basically. from them and Teller, which we all kicked out really quickly, is that Teller has <laughs> yeah, a public oh God, API that people could run from their own machines, and GitOps doesn't. But still, I mean, it, it's, it's root in your cluster. Yeah, I mean, there there are, so like um, Anthos actually does do it correctly. Um, uh, Anthos. Uh, uh, CM, Config Manager? Config one? manager, yeah. thank you. Where they actually let you specify for each namespace a different service account to use. Um, I think we've works uh, or Flux does that too. Um, what uh, the Argo folks originally had a like they actually had a PR to do it, and then they gave up on it when application sets got merged <laughs> because that actually solved what they thought was the problem. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I have also not run into a lot of folks besides me who think that Argo should be a multi-tenant system. Um, I still tend to be a little ahead of the curve on that one. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, you know, and, and it's not just Argo, right? I mean, you think about a cluster, 
your cluster is more than just Kubernetes, right? You've got monitoring. You've got, you know, and, and that monitoring system has identities. Yep. You've got, yeah, even if you're just using Prometheus and Grafana, you don't want everybody seeing it. Um, you've got, um, uh, uh, you know, you've got your GitOps controller. You might have GitLab running locally, yep. right? Um, you know, and then uh, if you're running Istio, Kiali's got a dashboard. Well, you need security around that. Um, you know, traffic has its own dashboard. You probably want to have some security around that. So a lot of things end up piling into this very, very quickly. Yep. Uh, and, and the hardest part is really just figuring out where the identities all fit together. Um, you know, so like, uh, you know, I kind of like to talk about, you know, supply chain security is the, the big buzzword now, right? Like you know, it's S-bombs. Um, and that stuff's really important. Don't get me wrong. Yep. I've been beating that drum for a long time. Uh, but identity management is a core piece of supply chain security that a lot of people don't think about. Um, I'm actually doing a uh, workshop with uh, John Osborne from ChainGuard at the B-Sides Northern Virginia next Friday. So if anybody's watching in DC, um, would love to see you um, about supply chain security. And you know, if you think about uh, a GitOps, you've got GitHub repos, you've got your cluster, you've got a GitOps controller. Well, the GitOps controller has to talk to your GitHub repo. What identity are you going to use? You have a GitHub action that creates a container and pushes that container into a registry. What identity are you going to use? Are you going to use a static key? I hope not. Um, you know, you've got, and, and then building these things, how are you going to automate that? Because you don't want to build that stuff manually. Um, and so the, that, that's all built in to, uh, you know, identity management is a big part of that, that um, I think a lot of people are missing when, when they talk about supply chain security. And that, that's really where, where, you know, I'm hoping to show you a little bit of that today, where we're really our sweet spot hits. Well, you have now said that. supply chain security five times, and we've had two VCs phone in and offer a <laughs> yeah! So, <laughs> all right. That's okay. They won't give me any money. <laughs> <laughs> no. Identity is obviously a big thing. multi tenancy is, is definitely, you know, we have a SIG dedicated to it now. We're trying to improve this in the Kubernetes. I mean, yep. is there software out there that can help us with this chaotic problem within a Kubernetes? Well, ecosystem? it's funny that you ask that, David. <laughs> yes, there is. Uh, so what does Open Unison do? So I haven't really talked a lot about what Open Unison does. Um, so, uh, you know, the open source identity management, which can mean a bazillion different things. Uh, our largest implementations are actually have nothing to do with Kubernetes. Um, we started off, Tremolo Security started off, nice Metallica shirt, by the way. Um, <laughs> Kubernetes start, or Tremolo Security started off as a idea to simplify authentication using reverse proxies. Um, so that should sound a little familiar. Um, and <laughs> the original idea was actually to use Kerberos to eliminate Agents and yeah, yeah. <laughs> it failed miserably. It was great, um, and uh, we ended up growing up from there, from doing authentication to doing just-in-time provisioning. So a user logs in, and we automatically update things, applications, and then um, that grew into a larger workflow engine. Then we got into the user provisioning game. Uh, and so we, we grew up from a simplistic authentication engine to a really powerful identity system. Um, and so, for instance, I'm going to be talking in uh, a couple of weeks at KubeCon or Kubernetes Community Days DC, and then also at KubeCon in Detroit about a public safety system we manage here in the DC region, Washington DC in the US for, for all of our international friends. Um, that is built on top of Kubernetes, but the system itself is actually has nothing to do with DevOps or Kubernetes. It's all about managing public safety systems. Uh, so our, our largest implementations are in kind of the more generic enterprise identity world. Um, I just found this niche in DevOps and Kubernetes and, and said, you know, nobody else is really doing a lot here. So this is probably a place where I can create a niche. Uh, and so 
in 2016, we came out with the namespace as a service utility that allowed you to integrate any kind of authentication into Kubernetes and allowed users to just log in, request namespaces, and, and admins could approve it. Uh, and this was light years ahead of what people wanted at the time. Um, and so we took that and we slimmed it down. We said, okay, let's just create a simple authentication portal, something that's quick and easy to deploy. Um, most of our users work with, uh, you know, uh, an external identity provider. So something like uh, Azure AD and Okta or an Active Directory. Uh, we have a few GitHub users. Uh, most of our open source users, um, or, or mo most of the GitHub users are in the open source world. They're, they're, they're not so much in the enterprise world. Um, and we, we, we always strive to make it as simple as possible to deploy with requiring as few external dependencies as possible. So we, we went through kind of an interesting journey where, and, and we're kind of going full circuit, is we started with a container that you would launch that would do all the work and deploy it because this was still Helm 2 territory. Then we created an operator when that's what all the cool kids were doing. Yep. And that... That helped, but it was still kind of a bit of a bear. Um, and then as we were getting more deployments, we found that most of the problems people were having had absolutely nothing to do with Open Unison and with certificates, load balancers, host names, IPs. Um, and so uh, we, we kind of took a step back and we created Helm charts to simplify it. Yes. But we ended up having like three Helm charts because Anybody who tells you there's eventual consistency in Kubernetes is lying to you. <laughs> I know it's another uh, controversial one that a lot of people don't agree with me with, but if you've ever had to deal with a uh, custom admission controller, you'll know what I mean. Um, and so uh, we ended up saying, okay, let's let's simplify that even further. So we, we keep created uh, the OU control command to really automate as much as we could. Um, and so that, that was one side of it as we said, okay, let's create this portal that's really simple to deploy. The other half of it that we wanted to do was we wanted to make it so that you didn't have to distribute anything for authentication into your cluster. So we didn't want you to have to download a kube control configuration file. We didn't want you to have to pre-publish configuration files. That's one of the harder things with a lot of OpenID Connect implementations is, you know, they'll they'll give you a kube config file, or you can use the, the great um, OIDC kube control plugin, but you have to pre-configure it with some stuff. We didn't want you to have to do any of that. We wanted everything to be pre-populated for you. So our first version, there's just a little button you click that says copy my kube control command, and we set up your entire kube config via kube control, including all your certificates. So everything is trusted off the bat. Um, a lot of developers didn't love that. It worked well if you had like a, a you know, jump box, God forbid. Um, but, you know, it, developers wanted to run Kube Control locally. They didn't really want to have to do this copy and paste thing. Uh, and so then we developed the OU login plugin, which you just give it the host name of your open unison and it automatically logs you in. You don't have to have a pre-configured Kube Control configuration. Um, the other... Uh, uh, priority we had was short-lived tokens. We really wanted to make it so that those tokens didn't live more than a minute and wow. to make it transparent to users. Because, you know, I mean, that the great thing about tokens is, is that they, they scale really well. The bad thing is, is if you lose it, bad things are going to happen. Um, that, that, that's a real risk when it comes to um, bearer tokens. So, um, and by the way, we, <laughs> yeah, and we, we, we get in the book, we get into an obscene amount of detail as to how that works and why. And it's actually a free chapter. So if you check out the um, uh, the GitHub repo, so no registration, nobody knows who you are, you can just download the PDF for that chapter. Um, but uh, yeah, so um, yeah, we, we, we wanted to make it so that you could very easily use short-lived tokens transparently. And we wanted to make GUIs easier. Like I said, I love the dashboard. So we wanted to make it easy to securely use the dashboard. Um, I'm, I'm a big proponent. Uh, and in fact, again, in the book, I spent an entire chapter on the security of the dashboard. 
um, because it's really important to understand how that security works when people say, oh, the dashboard's insecure. No, it's not insecure. It's insecure how people deploy it. You know, you're using kube control port forward or you're using kube control proxy. Yeah, it's insecure. Um, you know, you give it an RBAC, you know, a privileged RBAC credential. Yeah, it's insecure. Uh, but, you know, you use it properly with a reverse proxy, no less secure than anything else, uh, especially you add multi-factor authentication to it. Um, you know, you're in good shape. So, uh, yeah, so, um, you know, the 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 real benefit of using open unison is just being able to quickly get into clusters being able to integrate your enterprise authorization because most enterprises have some kind of authorization system um you know you know a uh, product does its job real well when a uh, massive public company that does identity management uses our little open source project for integration with their kubernetes clusters um so you know that that told me that we were probably on the right track for what, uh, how to do it. Um, so I know I've spent a lot of time talking. You want to get in some tech? Yeah, I'm excited to know. I want, I want to play with it. <laughs> um, so yeah, so uh, you've got a few clusters ready to roll, right? I do. Let's cover the, what have I prepared in advance? Uh, the answer as always is pretty much nothing. Uh, yep. So today we have the Open Unison documentation. This is available at openunison.github.io. The GitHub repository is available at github.com slash tremolo security slash open unison. And we have a couple of clusters today, kindly provided by our friends at Sivo. So I have three Yay, Sivo Sivo. clusters. <laughs> open Unison 1, Open Unison 2, Open Unison 3. We have a Docker desktop and Minikube, but they're not as fun. So uh what's on these clusters the answer is nada um all i have done is use Sivo's simplified app management to display engine x ingress with a load balancer so these are fresh clean happy to be open unison clusters sound good sounds good all right so in the documentation here we have some nice bullet points telling us that open unison simplifies access and increases security to things that all Kubernetes clusters need. And uh, let's get, do we just go jump straight into the deploying the syndication portal? Is that step one, Mark? Yeah, let's rock. All right. Okay, prerequisites. Ingress controller, check. Uh, Site-specific configuration. This is something we'll need to do at some point, I guess. And oh, do I need to install all your controllers as well locally? Yep. As you go through, I, I kind of wanted to give people a, a heads up as to what you're going to do and then go through all the the individual steps. And you're saying we can do all this in 35-ish minutes? Oh, uh, yeah. Quicker? Usually. I hope quicker than that, yeah. <laughs> all right. Okay. So I'm going to skip the Ingress controller. I deployed Nginx and good. Uh, we're going to deploy the Kubernetes dashboard. Nice. Let's do it. Uh, I'm just trusting. Yeah, that looks relatively safe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll go with that. Uh, da, da, da. So site-specific configuration. So is this for our Helm chart? I see there's a mm -hmm. values.yaml mentioned here that we can customize. So let's click on that and do a bit of a copy. And I'll just leave this here for as we need it uh, and then we can deploy the portal all right let's oh you skipped a step if you if you scroll up or nope go back I'm just, to the i'm just going to add the oh okay gotcha <laughs> uh all right so did i miss the step yeah you did the the three boxes there uh how to customize your uh, default values all right. Okay. Uh, so, okay. I should read the docs, shouldn't I? Sometimes I just get that carried <laughs> away with myself. Okay. So the first thing says, do we want to enable impersonation? You want to give us the fact, do you want to give us the TLDR in these options? Yeah, sure. So um, open unison will work whether you're running a on-prem cluster where you can change the, uh, the um, API server configuration flags for OpenID Connect. If you're, if you're running an on, 
excuse me, if you're running an on-prem cluster, that's always what I recommend as, as you know, bypass the, the impersonation proxy. But if you're running in a managed cluster where those, that's not a possibility, like Sivo, AKS, you know, GKE, any of these other ones, um, enable the impersonation proxy. And what that does is it launches a Kubo IDC proxy that acts as a impersonating proxy. So Kube Control actually interacts with that proxy, and then that proxy interacts with your API server on the user's behalf using Kubernetes impersonation. Um, and then like if you look in the audit logs, it'll actually say that, oh, this this action was performed you know, by David via impersonation. Okay. Um, so you're keeping all that information in there. Uh, the network, this is where uh, people tend to get hung up the most, um, mostly because it's the first thing you tend to deploy inside of a cluster is your authentication system a lot of times. Uh, and so they, they haven't quite wrapped their heads around how Kubernetes and networking works. Um, and so here's, you know, it's just three settings. Yeah, what do you want your host names to be? It's just the host, it always has to point to the load balancer for your cluster. Uh, or more specifically for your for your ingress controller. Mm -hmm. uh, and then finally, authentication. Inside of the values.yaml, you're going to find commented blocks of all of the different authentication mechanisms. You uncomment one of them, you go through the steps in the documentation, um, and uh, you go ahead and configure it. Um, you know, we try to, we tried to make the documentation as, um, single path as possible. So okay. even though you diverge a little bit, so like in the network session section, you've got the open unison host, dashboard host, and API server host. You're going to want those to point to your load balancer. So as an example, I'm a big fan of nip.io for development. So if you just did like Kate's IO dot, you know, IP dot nip dot IO or whatever you want to call it. Um, uh, okay. You need to put the IP address. You have to put the, the IP address right. in there. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't have to be dashes, but you could do that. Um, and then the next one's going to be your dashboard host. And then the last one is the, um, host name for your impersonation proxy. But does it work with dots? I thought it had to be dashes. No, it works fine with dots. It, I actually prefer to do dashes only because it looks more real, I guess. <laughs> um, but yeah, it'll work perfectly fine either way. All right. um, I'm going to make sure that I have not messed this up. I'm going to make sure this resolves to the IP address that we expect. Yep. So perfect. All right. Now, um, most enterprises will usually have like a wildcard cert that they're using. So you can configure this to do that. We actually include a mini cert manager that will generate all self-signed certs for you. So if you're just getting started, you just want to get the thing up and running, you don't mm -hmm. have to have like cert manager deployed ahead of time. We're going to we're going to generate those certificates all for you. Yeah. I guess it's important for people to know that when you use a service like Zip or NIP, is that Let's Encrypt will not give you a certificate for those domains. So you have exactly. to do something else. Exactly. Uh, okay, um, so let's, the networking bit looks fine to me now. Right, right? it's good to me. Yep. Okay, uh, the OU, I'm, I'm assuming we don't have to tweak this. This is just for the X5. Yeah, OU. I mean, if you really wanted to, you could. Um, <laughs> all right, I'll tell you what, we'll at least do uh, we'll the Academy. There we go. Yeah, I mean, they're all self signed certs. And Tremolo. Okay. Uh, we don't need to configure the image, cluster name, nope. impersonation. We I would think. actually change the uh, cluster name um, because we're going to talk about multi-cluster in a little bit. So, like, I usually call the first one like control plane or something like that, so that you know it's your uh, it's your primary. Okay. Uh, I just call it open unison one to match the cluster That's name fine themselves. Too. We're using JetStack's OIDC proxy, although it looks like you've got your own build of it. Is that tweaked in some way? Yeah. So we took over. Um, uh, uh, maintenance of the OIDC proxy uh, eh, about a year ago, I think. Yeah. Um, Jetstack, um, you know, it's it, Jetstack created a great project. Uh, we found that there were a couple of things that um, were missing that that we found 
would be really helpful. Um, and then we also wanted to just get it to the point where it's being maintained and actively tested and updated. Uh, all the libraries are updated. So one thing that we take great pride in at Tremolo is making sure that whenever we release software and you look at those known vulnerabilities, it's as close to goose eggs as possible. Um, and in fact, we have uh, continuous scanning of our containers. Everything's built on Ubuntu. So whenever uh, Canonical releases patches to CVEs, that automatically triggers rebuilds. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're constantly pushing out fresh versions. All right. OK, let's run through the rest of this values file then and get this thing deployed. Nothing here yep. in the dashboard looks like, looks like it needs changed. Yeah. Anymore. The the only time you really need to change that is if you have a custom deployment of the dashboard or um, the uh, if you use the Helm chart for the dashboard, you got to adjust a couple of those values. OK, I'm assuming we leave this false to use Cert Manager. Yep. Uh, true, we just use the Kubernetes basic Cert stuff, I guess. Yeah, it um, originally we thought it would be cool to use Kubernetes own built in certificates. So that everything was automatically trusted, except we found A, it wasn't automatically trusted, and B, uh, on ex on you know managed clusters, uh, you often couldn't even get access to it. Like that private key wasn't there, like EKS and AKS and whatnot. So um, we just always disable it now. And then uh, I think uh, you were, time. yep. So uh, our on the enterprise side, Active Directory and OIDC are definitely our largest implementation base. Mm -hmm. um, I always thought SAML would be more popular. It never was. Uh, people have just skipped SAML and seem to go straight to OpenID Connect. Um, yeah, SAML was then, the thing uh, for like two minutes, and then it just everything's I, a little there. longer than two minutes. <laughs> um, uh, you know, it, what really ch kind of changed things was um, the pandemic. To be honest, because. Uh, that's when organizations really shifted from using their own on-prem Active Directory Federation services, which is only SAML, to um, Azure AD, which supports both SAML and OpenID Connect. And because you know, SAML is really great in, in really uh, segmented networks because you don't have that back-channel communication that you have with OpenID Connect. But in when your identity provider is on the internet and it's Azure AD or it's Okta, who cares? <laughs> uh, okay, that's fair. That's fair. I'll, I'll, I'll apply that. Um, but uh, yeah, it 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 definitely uh, it has never been as popular as I thought it was going to be. Yeah. Um, All right. So we're we're going to go with GitHub, right? Yep. <laughs> okay. So, do so I need to create a GitHub one, application. Yep. So you're going to go into your uh, either an organization or you can do it on your personal settings and create a uh, OAuth app. All right. I'm not sure if I can. I can't remember if it flashes secrets you, and stuff. So I was going to do it. Is it okay to do on on screen? I mean, I would just delete it afterwards. All right. Okay. You know, people in chat or who are watching live, please be good neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, one day I'm going to learn to stop flashing tokens on a stream. <laughs> All right, let's go. OAuth oh, apps, new, open, unison, uh, code. Uh, and is this going to be my NIP IP? So that's going to be the, um, if you go to your network section, it's going to be open unison HTTPS your open unison host value slash auth slash github. Auth slash github. And we're, uh, I'm, I'm only telling you what's already in the doc. So um, you're, you're not getting anything secret here. All right. So you got that client ID that can go into the values.yaml. And uh, I'm assuming I we hate... the secret in a secret, no? Maybe? Uh, you're actually just going to put the secret in a file. And then OU control will create your secret for you. All right. And you got the client ID in there? OK, cool. Yep, it's there. Uh, no um, policies, I'm assuming we can skip that. You can skip that for now. I mean, we give you a lot of uh, uh, customization points. And then you know, if we have time to get into namespace as a service, that's where you get into that. But you don't need a data. The, the thing with Open Unison is we say only 
implement infrastructure you need for what you're going to do. So because the authentication proxy doesn't have any um, uh, asynchronous workflows uh, or self-service in it, um, we don't make you to deploy a database. We don't make you deploy anything for uh, notifications. So we want to keep it as simple as possible. Only deploy what you need for what you're going to do. Got it. So that looks good. It does look And then good. go ahead and uh, create a file with your GitHub secret in it. <laughs> uh, I might as well display Russell's comment just now. <laughs> All right. And safe. Nobody got it. Cool. All right. And so you already deployed uh, that. So you got to download, um, oops, almost, you got to download the OU control command for whichever platform you'd like. Is this M1 ready? Uh, yes, it will. Um, I'm assuming you have Rosetta installed. I do. Yeah. Okay. Uh, dash O O U C T L. No land. Oh, it must be a redirect. So dash F S. That's weird. What if you just do a W get on the? Uh, ah, where'd you go? I was and just making are... sure I could actually write. Oh no! Wait, I'm just being. Oh, you're in the con. Are you in a container? Uh, no, I've just got my parameters the wrong way around. Huh. Fail to receive data to disk. All right, I'll do well, it in my just... home directory. <laughs> Maybe that <laughs> temp just has, or is it small O for write to file? Am I just being? Really Honestly, small? I just use wget. Oh yeah, it's small O. It's ah small. yeah. <sighs> I like W get because it gives you a little progress bar. <laughs> All right. I'm old uh, school like that. Oh, I can't type. All right. Okay. User local. Is that? Oh, I hate typing my password on the screen. At least that one we can't see. I know, but I was doing it once on a stream with Alex Ellis and pseudo crashed <laughs> as I was typing. And then my password was just all over the place. Oh! Of course, I mean, I, I don't I don't duplicate any passwords, and it's only my local machine password, so it's not a big deal. But still. Now, yeah. I haven't done it yet, but do you have the Touch ID keyboard? Uh, so I, I type on a good keyboard, but... Oh, you've got the me mechanical, okay. But I keep this um, little thing to the side purely for fun, for my fingerprint. Gotcha, <laughs> gotcha. I, I haven't done it yet, which is weird, because I live by Touch ID, um, but... Uh, you can set up sudo to use Touch ID on on Mac. Nice. Uh, I need to look into that then one day. You can also I, can, I know I could do it on my watch, but then I always find it weird oh, double okay. tapping it as well. Which is... <laughs> anyway, um, we're, we're digressing. Let's let's get back on track. So we've got OU us control. Digress? <laughs> so yeah, so you've got OU control. You're ready to rock and roll. All right. So we're going to install. Point it to. Our secret file and then the YAML file. Yep. Okay. So the YAML file is our values, right? And the secret file is my please don't copy. Exactly. Please don't copy me dot text. I think I called it. Yes. No, well, don't if we get an error, we'll know that's uh don't copy me, please. <laughs> I should have called it. Yeah, I secret. seem to remember there was a please in there. <laughs> All right. So is this going to create a Kubernetes secret with our secret or client secret for the GitHub app? And do I help deploy into our cluster? Exactly. Oh, no database section. Uh, check out the values YAML. Do I have a, oh, I know why, shoot. Okay, see where it says enable provisioning is true? I gotta fix this. I was messing with it. Kids, don't mess with uh, the website right before the uh, the demo. Um, it's in the open unison section. Yep. Yeah. So change that to false, mm -hmm. and then on the next line, change that to true. 
go ahead and run. I gotta fix that right after this. There we go. Yeah, so I decided not to tell people to make the secret because what people were doing was they would do echo secret into base six, you know, pipe base 64. Mm -hmm. And so everybody would be telling me it's not working. It's not working. It's not working. I keep getting access to nine. Well, yeah, because echo adds that, that, that slash N <laughs> at the end. Um, and so I was like, you know what, I'm just going to take that out. And, and, and I didn't want to have it on the command line cause I hate having secrets as command line parameters. So, um, so yeah, so we, we actually embed Helm into this command. Uh, so it's just running the Helm charts, but the nice thing is, is that it's paying attention to um, the cluster. Like it's waiting for things to finish. It gives little pauses. I, I, I love SIVO to death, for, especially for my testing clusters. I do find that when you're very heavy on watches and you're very heavy on CRDs the way we are, because uh, everything is configured through a custom resource. Um, it, uh, I've I found SIVO to be a little more uh, persnickety than most other clusters I've worked with. Okay. So you said this what we're in, everything is configured by some sort of custom resource. So you can get up Pretty to much. the entire open unison deployment then as well? Oh, yeah. Uh, oh. Yeah, we've got, um, we actually have, uh, we haven't formally released it yet, but we have a Argo version that uses waves. So you create the secret manually and you point Argo to um, this special repo that's just a re you know, just a sync of all the correct repos, but with the wave um, um, uh, um, not label. Um, what's the other thing besides the label annotation. I can put on an object? Thank you. Annotation. I know Kubernetes, I promise. <laughs> um, with the correct annotations, with the right waves, and so that way you don't use the OU control command, um, at least for that instance. Um, so uh, uh, this is uh, running. Yeah, I'm going to do is some it, uh, investi investigation. So. It's a it's a slightly larger pod, and it's just pulling I down think it's the, just pulling uh, the images, yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah, that, that that's strange because uh, I mean that Kubo IDC proxy is only forty five megs. The orchestra one's pretty big, um, so hopefully, think it. Is, I think it gives up after a thousand tries. <laughs> All right, uh, I forgot out. what that that top is which is weird because uh oh you're 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 probably running your cluster in um in europe you know what i don't even think i paid attention to where i stuck this thing uh not that it should matter because it's all coming from docker hub no it doesn't tell yeah. you a region by default where where'd i put it i'm looking in your bottom left oh yeah london like yeah so i don't know maybe uh Maybe they just don't have good uh, networking over to Docker Hub from London. Um, um, yeah. It, take a look at the events. Is there? Uh, well, let me. Is there a something that's not mounting? Oh, we're missing. Oh, there we go. Secret volume orchestra not found. Do uh, K get nodes or K get secrets? Yeah. Okay. Take a look at your, um, there's a pod that's called uh, Open Unison Operator. Take a look at that. Did we miss something? Uh, or I'm sorry, look at the logs for that okay. pod. Yeah, I finally just gave up. Oh. All right. Where? Oh, interesting. It had a problem talking to see, see, this is what I mean, where it'll, it'll sometimes have weird issues with, uh, Sivo's API server. Okay. Let's do this. Um, just go ahead and rerun the command again. So one thing about the OU control command is it's designed to be rerunnable. So if something does fail, 
you can always rerun it with the exact same parameters and it will check to see if things so like the secret already exists so let's say um uh so let's see here there's orchestra secret source so right now it's redeploying that oh right, there we go yeah there we go okay cool um so like one nice thing about ou control is let's say you're just doing an update to your configuration but you're not changing the secret you don't need to have that secret file. It'll say, oh, the secret's already there. I'm not even going to, you know, unless you specify a new secret to rotate it, I'm just going to leave it alone. Like it, it builds some of the intelligence that an operator would want to have, a human operator would want to have during deployment. There we go. Right. I'm assuming that's going to be much quicker now since it's. Yeah. I mean, you're already running. So it's. Um, We're just waiting for it to get to the point where it's uh, um, ready one one. There we go. Good. Now the yep. old one, and you can see like it's saying, "Oh, I'm going to wait until there's just one pod because that's the number of images I want. I don't want to release control until uh, um, we're at that point. So we're going to wait for things to to terminate." It's waiting for the eventual consistent to be consistent, right? Exactly. <laughs> Um, you know, which is something that like Helm doesn't do, right? Helm doesn't, uh, you know, if it fails because of a webhook, it just fails. Um, which is where my whole eventual consistency is a lie comes from. Yeah, it's, I have that uh, all, that problem all the time. I mean, admission admission controllers are definitely a problem, but finalizers are the ones that really get on my, my yeah. nerves. Yeah. Um, although I had fun this morning with a customer with pod disruption budgets, um, <laughs> that, that, that really caused some heartburn combination of, uh, pod disruption budget and, uh, um, having to rebuild a cluster that had lost its, uh, authentication token. Oops. I'm going to try and speed this up a little bit. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> when in doubt, force. Uh, yep. And so the next thing it's doing, so what you've done right now is you've deployed the orchestra pod. So that's got a very simple baseline configuration. Okay. And then, yeah, yeah, here we go. So joys of, uh, web hooks. Um, just go ahead and run it again. It should be much quicker this time. Cause so I was just waiting, waiting for, for the certificate and uh, we yeah. probably had it a bit too quickly. Um, but, uh, I forgot what I was going to say. What were we talking about before the, oh, admission controllers. Yes. Um, and, and, uh, finalizers and pod disruption budgets. Um, yeah, I mean, I love admission controls. I mean, we use admission controllers cause we've got very complex, um crs that uh just can't be can't be um um they just they can't be uh um validated just through schema like even the new whatever the the new schema validation language in 25 um you know there's that new scripting language um that it, you can embed into uh your schema for crs in 1.25 it's not oh, turing really? complete oh, yeah I, I, I can't yeah i can't remember the name of it but the idea is is that um i think it's a beta in 25 it's either an alpha or a beta in 25 it's not ga um but uh it, it lets you it gives you a little more capabilities around validating schema rather than just open api schema. i'll try one more search before i give up on it but i'm gonna to have to look into this combiner that's what it is or no combiner is the name of the release there is in there i cannot remember the name of it for the <laughs> life of me then again i couldn't remember what an annotation was so i don't know why anybody would listen to me um I thought it went into 25 as a beta. I don't know. We'll find out later. 
It probably yeah. did. I've, to be honest, I've just not paid attention to the 125 release, really. Because I, I mean, I've not upgraded Clustered to it yet, but that is my next plan. Gotcha. So. All right, let's uh, get back over to our dogs. And here. It's shut down. On? I'm still trying to delete that pod. I'm assuming it doesn't respect the seg term or it's just not got a pro. It does. Out. It's just the, um, it, uh, it's cleaning up itself. Um, I do find that it takes a while to, to shut itself down. Um, although this does seem to be taking longer than usual, usually within about 30 seconds. Maybe I should have sprung for some bigger nodes. <laughs> what uh, what size did you go with? Uh, four CPUs, eight gig of RAM. Nice no, that's, that's yeah. what I've been using. Yeah, we've got a probe failure for Check Alive. I mean, it's unhealthy. It should be dying. <laughs> Why won't you die? Oh, there we go. All right, now it's it, it just needed to restart before it finally. Yeah, it looked like something was going on there. Um, yeah, I've got to spend a little more time. I, I figure Sivo's probably exposing an underlying issue that I need to to look at when it comes to the way that we're. Uh, um, oh, but it's there. It's waiting a few seconds. So it waits about ten seconds. All right. All right. So, like yeah. Business. So if you take a look at your pods, ah, actually, you should be able to just log in. So obviously, there's no, uh, it's a self-signed cert. Yeah. Uh... So you've got to let us uh, see, see all your unmentionables. I'm pretty sure I used that org. So. Yeah, you use Rock Code Academy as your uh, authorizing organization. Cool. So you're in. So now you click on that dashboard and uh, you'll be in. You won't be able to see anything because you still have to enable some RBAC policies. So yeah, hey. so if you look at the bell in that upper right hand corner, you'll you'll see a bunch of RBAC errors. And if you look at your little human on the right hand side, because you're using impersonation, it'll actually have your GitHub username. I wrote yeah. that. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so yeah, if you grant now the nice thing is is you can grant RBAC based on your GitHub orgs. So okay. you're not granting RBAC directly to a user. So if you go back to the documentation, um, I actually have a uh, example in there. Um, so scroll, uh, you, actually on the right-hand side, see where it says GitHub RBAC bindings? So you want to copy that and just change the uh, group from Tremolo Security Owners to, you know, whatever you want, really. All right, so we're saying all owners here. Get cluster admin and the cluster. Yep. And I call this RBAC. So now you go back to your dashboard and you can see all the errors are gone. Oh, maybe not. I might have to log click out on. and back in. No. Click on the um, that little bell thing again. It's forbidden. Interesting. Go back to the main uh, open unison screen. And then in the upper left-hand corner, you'll see your name, raw code. Click on that. And I actually can't read it. It's really fuzzy. But do you see raw code? I don't see anybody called raw code owners. That's probably the problem. So if if you uh, want to just be, uh, also that if you want to just do team? raw code slash, or my you know any one of those. Would that work? Just raw code? No, it has to be slash. So slash nothing means you want to let the entire organization in. All right. Let's just do the cluster team because I, I trust me. 
Is that is that a smart move? No. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, now it's all gone. So now you are in fact a cluster administrator and you can do everything to your heart's content that the dashboard lets you do. Um, stuff like the terminal works beautifully. You want to terminal into uh, things. Ah. So, um, and then we've got all sorts of little controls in the back. Like, you know, if you log out of the main portal and that'll, that'll break you out of this. So you can't leave the, the main portal you know, you can't leave the main portal, but still get into the dashboard. Um, you know, most enterprises have policies around things like idle timeout, stuff like that. Um, and then if you want to access your cluster directly using kube control, you go back to that main screen. You click on home, see that Kubernetes token. Wow, I think uh, my this internet fast. Struggling. <laughs> well, I, I do stream on a, a 5G connection, which is usually pretty solid. <laughs> really? But, yeah. That's impressive. No, the fiber company for this building wanted an extortionate amount of money. And I was like, no, I'll go with 5G. And I actually get like 500, 600 meg down and like 300 well, meg up. Well, from what I realize, I think y'all Europeans are much harder on your telcos for marketing nonsense than we are here in the States. I think here, as long as it's not, you know, 1G, it counts as 5G. There we go. There it is. Okay, so it took a second. So now you've got um, a kube control command and a Windows kube control command. And if you actually look, there's a little set oh. of boxes <laughs> next to the word kube control command. It makes it a lot easier. And so you take that. And what I would do is don't use the same kube control configuration. So that way you don't lose your... Uh, you know, potentially overwrite your existing context. It's, it's um, all right. I'm using Kubi, so all of my oh, they're okay. All, they're all different files. So. Gotcha. Well, so yeah. So what's going to happen is you paste that in, and it's going to generate a kube control configuration file using the kube control command. So it's going to go to whatever. So now you can see if you do a kube control get nodes. Nodes. Yeah. There you go. You now have access to everything, um, and so uh, the uh, oh, left the phone down here. Um, the uh, you know you're right now going through that that Kubo IDC proxy, and, and the reason we use that is because um, What's Kubernetes. The who am I command again? There is a who am I command. Is that a plugin? Uh, oh. That is a plugin. I. I think the API was included in 25, but they haven't added anything to kube control yet. Um, I would say do something you're not allowed to do, but you're a cluster admin. I know, I've got everything, so. So you've got everything. Um, but the nice thing is, is that you didn't set up any certificates. You didn't set up any host names. It all just worked. Now, really cool thing is, why don't you set up a watch on like kube control get pods or whatever? Well, can you help me understand what actually happened here? Like, yeah, is, so is this set um, up as service? You or? drew two owl, two circles, <laughs> and then you had Kubernetes. Um, <laughs> so what happened was, if you look at your, if you go back in your um, command history to the actual command. It's going to be this big giant thing. Oh, I'm just going to scroll up. Yeah, there you go. So what we're doing is we're actually using all existing kube control configuration commands. Like the, you're doing the, you didn't download anything to actually run this. Um, and so the idea here is that we wanted it so that you didn't have to deploy anything to access clusters other than kube control. So what do we do? We set the server up with the correct host name. Now in this instance, that host name will be our API, our uh, API proxy. So you're not talking directly to the Sivo API server. You're talking to the kube OIDC proxy. We set up the certificate for it. We set up um, 
the OIDC configuration, so where the issuer is, the certificate for the issuer. We, and then we went ahead and also set up your uh, initial ID token and refresh token. So now you can just go to your heart's content and Kube Control is going to continuously refresh that token um, until one of two things happen. Either you idle time out or if you log out of Open Unison, it will end your session. So the okay. security folks and enterprises love that, that there's a way to actually kill a session in, within about a minute. And um, that's just by revoking the refresh token, right? Yep. And then like, let's say, you know, David's got to be walked out for whatever reason. Um, you know, oh, he said got being he, fired he, again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, you know, it's Tuesday, right? Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, you go in and the session is stored as CRs, so you just delete all of David's sessions, and within a minute, those tokens are going to stop working. Oh. Uh, so I think it's called, I think if you do like a kube control get OIDC dash sessions and open unison, you'll see them. Uh, OIDC dash sessions. Oh, yep. Sweet. So you've got a bunch of sessions open. You delete those, and then within about a minute, your your token will become useless. So as an operator, you want to you want to kill somebody's sessions. All right, I need to look at one of these. <laughs> sure. Now I am the first person to say you should never store anything sensitive in a um, CR. Uh, I break that rule here because this is all encrypted um, and RBAC protected. So if somebody has this, unless they also have the decryption key, they don't have access to anything. Yeah. Um, I think it's the binary and, encrypted and then base, base encoded. No? Uh, I don't know. I see the equals and I think maybe. Base yeah, the, that one's just base 64 encoded, I think. Um, but uh, that has to match up with stuff in the encrypted ID token and the access token. Um, nice. I, you so know what? Yeah. There, there's so many benefits from storing stuff in custom resources because I get to hook into all of the tooling that I already know. Yep. Uh, and I, th I just think this is a really, really sleek way of doing it. So this is very cool. It, it, it works really well. Um, we used to do it in a database and back when we first started it and once CRs became a thing, I remember when I first said, you know, how would I store custom information in Kubernetes? This is, this is before CRs were even available. And I was like, you know, would I just talk to etcd directly? And they're like, no. And I go, why? He goes, you know, you know are you some kind of masochist? You want to talk <laughs> to etcd directly? You, you enjoy pain? Um, and so the, the CRs, I think, are are really going to become a big part of what makes Kubernetes your um, your data center operating system rather than just a, a, a pod control management system, a container control management yeah. system. I really hope that uh, the API machinery team adds some sort of sensitive or encrypted label for custom resource fields so that even that yeah. can be handled um, by the API server. But... I mean, I've, I've got a whole rant on <laughs> secrets management in Kubernetes. Um, but uh, now the cool thing is a lot of people don't like what we did with um, copying and pasting that token. Mm -hmm. um, and so th if you go back to our documentation, there is a, uh, or I don't know, do you have um, a crew installed, the crew plugin installed? No, I don't. Oh, okay. Um, so we have a, a, a crew plugin where that actually let a uh, kube control plugin that lets you bypass that whole thing. So you'll see a picture of it here where, you know, um, you run kube control get nodes. Okay. It's not authenticated. This was the first time I ever made a GIF out of a video. <laughs> I think this took me about four hours. Uh, but you see that it pops open the, the browser window, you log in, and, and similar to, you know, if, if you're working with any of the cloud 
CLIs that pop open um, nice. or the, the OU login. But the, the cool thing about that is, is that there's no preset configuration options at all. There's nothing to distribute because that, that's one of the hardest things to do in an enterprise is distribute things, keep it updated. Um, I've got a bank that's probably my largest Kubernetes customer and they've held off on just this, the OU login plugin for almost two years now, just because it's a pain for them to go through the um, submitting something to be distributed across the bank. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's got to get scanned. It's got to get, you know, there has to be a deployment plan. You know, there's a central repository. You know, you can't just download stuff and run it. You've got to go and get the official thing. Um, so we wanted to give you the option to do both. Uh, now we, you know, it's, it's quarter to two. So um, <laughs> I, I have all the time in the world. Um, do you want to try uh, adding a cluster for multi-cluster? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, cool. So grab your, your, uh, yep, go right there. You got it. So what we did with multi-cluster, so there are two ways you can do multi-cluster with Open Unison, depending on your um, level of comfort with Kubernetes. You can do it where every cluster gets its I, this happens regardless. Every cluster always has its own open unison. And the reason why we do that is, let's go back to, we were talking about silos, right? If I have my own cluster and I want to add Argo CD to it and do SSO into Argo CD, I don't want to have to go to you as the cluster manager, as, as the Kubernetes team and say, please integrate my cluster. I want to integrate into my clusters open unison so that I can do SSO. Um, and so everybody gets their own open unison. Now, you can either set up each open unison to go back to your main identity provider. So like this would be basically repeating the process we just did for every cluster, which is a little painful, but if your main Kubernetes goes to, or your main cluster, your control plane cluster goes down, it doesn't take out everybody else. So it limits your, your blast radius. Uh, the major downside to that is if you don't own the connection up to your identity provider, that can be painful. And, and again, silos and enterprise, the people who own authentication don't generally aren't the same people who own your Kubernetes clusters. They're different people. They care about different things. And they have a backlog of people who want onboarding, you know, from here to the other ocean. So, you know, it doesn't matter which way you go around. Um, so it, it's a trade off of, you know, uh, uh, of blast radius versus flexibility. Um, I've seen a tendency to move towards the flexibility side in enterprise more and more because people are getting more comfortable with with low downtime Kubernetes, maybe not zero downtime because somebody's selling you zero downtime, they're probably lying. Um, but you know, low downtime Kubernetes, you know, planned downtime Kubernetes, um, and so th this now means that I can now grant authentication to new clusters. I can automate onboarding new clusters. Um, whenever I want. And so that makes it easier to automate. You know, we talked about small clusters versus big clusters. Well, if you do want to go that small cluster route or virtual clusters, you can now have every cluster has its own authentication into that control plane and you can control it yourself. So it gives you the best of both worlds. So in order to do that, you treat your control plane open unison as an identity provider. So that means, you, you know, that work where we did where there's a client secret and you've got to exchange that trust, that's not rocket science, but it's manual tasks that no one likes to do. Well, everything's API enabled, so why don't we just automate that? So that's what we did was we wanted to make it so that you enter as little information as possible. So the, the first thing you do is you do this piece where you go back to your main values YAML. So we're still on the control plane. 
And if you go down to the Open Unison section, see where it says, um, well, you want to get rid of it, but oh, all right. there's already a show port org it's false. So you want to change that to true. All right. And then um, go ahead and save that, redeploy Open Unison using um, the, yep. And notice I'm you're not an, putting your secret doing, right? list I am a professional. Well, well, yeah. <laughs> I know how to copy expert. and paste from dogs. <laughs> I don't. So you know, I assume no one else does either. Um, so this is update so, in our, the open units and deploy that we have in our control plane cluster. Uh, it's exactly. going to add something to this, this thing. Yeah. Right? So see where you now see there's that little uh, uh, bump where it's got that little tree there. Yeah. So now it's breaking up the badges. So that's a little more organized because once you start adding clusters, you know, you got a dozen clusters. You don't want to have 24 badges all over the screen. It gets difficult to organize. Um, plus the other nice thing is you're probably not going to give access to everybody, to every cluster. You know, usually certain clusters, only certain people will have access to. Mm -hmm. This makes it a little bit easier to organize that. Um, so uh, while that's updating, we can actually get started on the next piece, which is um, there's a new Open Unison Values XAML. And what's important about this particular file is that it does not have um, it, it does not have um, uh, an authentication section because we figured that out for you. We already have all the information from the control plane. So why ask you to put in information that we already know, you know, on our side. Mm -hmm. um, so if you go ahead and you uh, uh, start editing that, um, All right. So I need the IP address for cluster uh, two. Yep. I can do this in the command line. <laughs> All right, so cluster two, and then yep, yep. beautiful. Uh, I can do this. Hold on. Uh, so oh, you, you got better Vim skills than I do. <laughs> Dev. Oh. Boom. All right. Uh, Damn. If I knew that, I would have passed my CKAD a lot more easier. <laughs> I'm assuming we don't need to modify anything else, right? This is just. The... Yep. Everything else is good. Do we need to point it to cluster one? So, th so this is where the beauty of, of Kubernetes comes in, right? So you're going to set up the, you're going to, uh, so you've downloaded, um, let me think about this. So the way I typically do this is I don't use Kubi myself. So I create a single kube control file with contexts to both. So what I'll do is I'll take the bootstrap content, bootstrap file, and then I'll make that my main kube config file. And then I'll log into my control plane, run the run the onboarding command, you know, that that uh, the kube control creation command and that gives me a unified kube config file. all right so our control I, plane is going to reach out to the other clusters too yeah yeah so you 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 want to have your 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 control plane file and your um or your your bootstrap for your uh satellite cluster okay and does this, and then does the x509 your... need to match like the no the, no, no. All right, okay. no. No, we do all the certificate exchange and everything. Because again, we know what those certs are, so why bother asking you? Okay, so what do I need to do now? I need to. So uh, you want to be pointing to your um, satellite and install the dashboard. That I can do. Yep. That part's easy. And, and so then uh, the last part is creating the uh, kube config and then running the OU control satellite install. 
All right, okay. So, all your control install satellite. This is now cluster 2.yaml. So, let me. Yep. Did the other uh, deployment finish? It uh... almost. <laughs> uh, did it uh... actually finish or did it fail? It, it failed. Oh, there it goes. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's fine. I think it was just a webhook again. Yeah. Okay, so um, this is going to be my... Uh... So that's going to be your control plane configuration. And then the second one is going to be your satellite configuration. Yeah, that's going to and be... And we're hard. using the <laughs> Go SDK, so I don't know if that's going to work. Because we don't, I don't know. Because uh, doesn't Kubi just wrap? All my conflicts are in different files, so we're going to have to merge. Yeah, what, I, what you can do is, so this is how I do it. I set kube config to the bootstrap for the satellite. Uh -huh. And then I log into my control plane, get a token, and in the same kube config, run that. So that way I get a merged configuration. Okay. So let's jump back. Sorry, I've made this really difficult now by using Kubi. <laughs> well, it's 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 an interesting problem that I need to take a note on because one of the things that we're working on is um, simplifying this because we always want to make it easier. Um, so you know, it's a good point. I I tend not to use Kubi. So you know, is okay. there a way to make it easier when somebody is using it? Okay, so we're now using this yeah, coupon yep. config. Uh, so now if you go to log into your control plane and pick up a token. Oh, I just did that. Okay, and then paste it in. Oh, all right, shit. Okay. So on to cluster two <laughs> on my control plane, and I want to grab. Uh, run the kube control command. Uh-huh. So now if you run KCTX, you should have more code control yes. contexts. So yeah, so you've got now two. Perfect. So now your your open units in one context is your control plane, open units in two is um gotcha. your satellite. I've so caught that's up what now. you're gonna use. Too many steps ahead of me. That's what it was. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we want to do open rock order open units from one. Nope, just nope. open units in dash one because you want just the context. And then open, open units in dash two. So now, if you look at your values.yaml, we actually updated it for you. So what we've done is we've created a client secret inside of the control plane, big, nasty, random monster. So you don't have to think of it yourself. And now we're deploying open unison as a satellite directly into um, your satellite cluster. Yeah, I'll be able to look at it in a minute. I also make things really difficult for us in this session by always using temp directories for everything that I don't know the path to. <laughs> Um, yeah, that makes sense. But, because um, I have pair directory history, so I never like to be in a real directory when I do demos because then I have all the commands in my in that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> no, that makes that makes sense. Um, so yeah. So now what we're just doing is we're installing Open Unison the same way. It's just if when you look at the values.yaml that you create that uh, you created, you're going to see that it is. Um, it now has an OIDC section in it. And that OIDC section points to your control plane as your um, identity provider. So can I see these satellite clusters as custom resources on the control plane cluster? Um, not no. to, the easiest way is to actually do a Helm list in the Open Unison namespace.
and you'll see there it is, satellite-Kubernetes Satellite 3. So that is your satellite cluster and all the resources associated with that chart. So it created a um, identity provider. It created a, uh, like if you do kube control get applications in the open unison namespace on your control plane, you'll see that there is a cluster IDP Kubernetes satellite. Yep. That's where we onboard all of your satellites onto. Do a kube control get trusts. Uh, oh, I don't maybe think it's not. there yet. Oh, uh, okay, now it might be. Oh, maybe not. not um, yeah, there are too many objects to keep track of. But if you now go back to Open Unison, hey. see where you have that Kubernetes satellite? Now, if you click on it and you go to the dashboard, going to make you click through a bunch of stuff because we're using all self-signed certs and boom now you still have the same problem with a little bell because of our back but the important thing is is you now have a satellite open unison deployed and you didn't have to do anything with open id connect or github or anything else and i can just swap so between these different the uh, different <laughs> clusters like so exactly um and then, you know, we haven't really talked about other applications, but, you know, like Argo or Grafana or anything else, you can now integrate that here. You know, you can, you can integrate it into your control plane um, or into your, um, into your um, uh, satellite. Now, the other cool thing is the OU control, if you click on, like, click on Kube Control uh, Satellite Tokens, So this actually runs its own open unison. So you can go directly to this host too, if you want to bypass it. So you've got that option as okay. well. Um, so like the OU control command that I was talking about, you know which hosts you have access to, you just type in OU control dash dash host equals my open unison, pops up the browser, you log in, you close. So you don't have to go through this rigmarole. Um, and then, you know, of course, if you've got you know uh, a CA that you want to use, you can use that instead of having to do the self-signed certificates. You know, we we wanted to just make it as easy as possible to get started. This is really cool. I like this. Thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, what we haven't really talked about is so we we we've, we've done the authentication portal. Um, we haven't really talked about namespace as a service. Um, do you want to deploy namespace as a service? Well, I, I don't know what namespace as a service is. Do you want to give me the, the pitch? Yeah, so namespace as a service, the idea is you can log in to a self-service portal like this, and there's a little button that'll say request, uh, or there'll be a button here that says new namespace. Click on new namespace, I enter some information, like what I want the namespace name to be, what um, I can add additional attributes, you know, for things like chargeback and labeling. Um, and then I hit submit. And then the cluster owners say yay or nay. And then Open Unison will actually provision that namespace. It'll do a few things. It'll provision the namespace. It will provision the RBAC bindings. If you want to use external groups, so like let's say you wanted to use um, your GitHub teams to manage access, it'll map those for you. And so at that point, you now have a namespace. And then you can also customize the workflow to add things like network policies, resource quotas, et cetera. So now as a business owner, I've been able to get a namespace without running kube control. And as a cluster manager, I've been able to create a namespace without running kube control. So that, that's the first part of it. The second part of it is who has access to it. So we allow you to do either internal or external or both. And by that, I mean, you can let Open Unison have a set of groups for you and manage it that way. You can rely on an external identity provider like GitHub or Active Directory and groups there, or you can do both. And we find folks that use this functionality, they always start with, oh, I just want to use the enterprise groups. 
and then they realize, oh, it's a lot harder than we need when there's an emergency to onboard someone. And so we want to use the internal groups too. And so what that then gives you is the ability to do self-service to get access to those namespaces, all without having to do, um, uh, what you want, all without having to do um, uh, any kube control commands. And then we keep an audit log of everything that's happening. So like at KubeCon 2020 Europe, yeah, it was 2020 Europe. That was the one that got delayed twice, right? Um, yep. It was all virtual. Um, yeah. I did a session on learning RBAC called I Can RBAC and So Can You, where I used Open Unison with Fairwinds RBAC Manager to let people create namespaces without actually having to go through any approval process, where you created a team which would provision the RBAC. Um, are you familiar with what Fairwinds RBAC Manager does? Okay, so for anybody who isn't, it lets you do access management via labels inside of namespaces, really great tool. Um, so you would request, instead of a namespace, you would request a, um, uh, I forget the name of the object, but it's basically a Fairwinds RBAC object that would define what labels namespaces would have and you would have access to those namespaces. And then at that point, once that got approved and provisioned, you could create all the namespaces you wanted associated with your Fairwinds object. So as a business owner, I could create all the namespaces I wanted. And as long as I had access via that Fairwinds object, it would create the namespace and set the appropriate labels. Um, so it's a really powerful tool. My favorite thing that I'm working on right now is um, virtual cluster as a service, which is really cool. So if, if you're not familiar with virtual clusters, it's, um, it's essentially a K3s that runs inside of your cluster and it synchronizes objects and gives you a smaller worldview. So you think you have your own cluster, but in reality, you're still running in a large multi-tenant cluster. So uh, uh, Loft, the folks that make vCluster, recently released a cluster API for provisioning of this. So what you can actually, what we have is this way where, where this portal, and I can show it to you, where when you request a namespace, there's a little option. Do you want a namespace or do you want a vCluster? You pick vCluster, we provision the vCluster, we provision open unison into it, and we link it via SSO. And now you have a vCluster ready to go with all your RBAC bindings, and that's it. All right, well, um, I would love to get home for my kids' bedtime, so I'm gonna share your screen. <laughs> and okay, why don't cool. you give Let's us the B-Cluster demo, and we can take a look at it, because it sounds pretty awesome. And then yeah. we'll wrap this up, because I reckon that's we could talk about this stuff for, for a couple of hours. <laughs> all right, can you see my screen? Uh, da, da, da. Yes, we can see your screen. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to log in. Don't save. So I've, I've deployed a couple of these, um, but I think I deleted them, to be honest. Um, so this, this link didn't exist. This request access link doesn't exist in your open unison. Yep. And this badge, this new Kubernetes space badge, doesn't exist. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to open up the dashboard, make it a little easier to follow what's going on, because there's a lot of moving pieces here. So we got our dashboard up and running. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to say create a new namespace. So this is our namespace as a service. It's multi-cluster. So this has just a single cluster for management. And I'm going to do test raw code because I'm really original. And I'm going to choose vCluster and test. So that's amid the request. Now, I've gotten an email that says, hey, Mark, somebody's requested. Oh, cool. And so this gives you the current roles. We're, we're in the midst of making this a little bit better because there's just more information you're going to want to have. Now, some of the fun things you can do here with custom approvals is you can do escalation. So I'm not doing my job. It's been a week. You know, escalate it to my manager or escalate it to someone else or automatically close it. Um, we're also doing things around capacity management where if you request the namespace and 
there's a certain amount of open capacity, just let it through. Don't bother requesting it. Um, because we're tied into the cluster, we can do all that fun stuff. I'm just going to go ahead and approve the request. So while that's going, I'm going to go ahead and show you the reporting, right? So we're keeping track of all this stuff. And when it comes time for the auditors to come by, you know, you can give them access, you can generate the Excel spreadsheet, um, all that stuff's being tracked. So let's come to the dashboard. And if we go to the in unison namespace. Let me go check out pods. Let's see here, did it launch? Didn't. All right, so the first question is, did I make the appropriate, uh, did I make the appropriate sacrifices to the gods of live demos? That's okay. Sometimes this takes a little while. Oh, wait, actually, first, let me see here. Test. Oh, this test raw code. And okay. okay, so it's actually deploying our virtual cluster. That's right. First, it deploys the virtual cluster. Then it launches a, um, a Helm chart that launches a job that integrates it. So you can see it's actually building out the dashboard for us. And this is actually our open unison. So what's actually happening now, you're seeing it in real time is we've created the virtual cluster. Now we're integrating that virtual cluster into Open Unison. And so if we look at these uh, pods, we're actually looking at our, um, our uh, whatchamacallit, our uh, uh, virtual cluster being stood up. Yeah. Um, and so this is a little bit of a slow moment, but what's happening is behind the scenes, is we wrote a custom hook into our onboarding workflow that uses the cluster API that Loft built for vCluster to create the vCluster. Once, and then we just wait for that vCluster to, to be done. Once that vCluster is done, we then return execution to go ahead and kick off that job. So now if I look at this, I'm pretty sure that's running. So. If I go to the open unison namespace, I look at pods. So this is still running. So this should look familiar, right? Yeah. <laughs> so this is that automated. We, 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 we took a, uh, 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 we took a pod and we put kube control V cluster and helm in it. So that way we could automate all this stuff. So, all of that pain you went through of setting a context, we did that automatically with the V cluster. Right. So now, let's see, do I have access to it? I don't. So I'm going to go ahead and log out and log back in. So now I've got a new V cluster dashboard. Now, the dashboard actually doesn't really work too well because vCluster by default doesn't deploy metrics. Um, so we're still working out the kinks here, but you can see we, we've got it automated so you even see which dashboard you're in. And then when you get a token, um, I didn't really think this through, did I? Let's see if I can set this up so that you can see what's going on here. I'm going to make this the same size. And then if I switch my sharing, whoa, that's cool. <laughs> I don't get out of this. There we go. So I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to share that. That makes it a little bit easier. Can you see that now? Okay. Uh, can you drag the height down a tiny bit of your window? Of oh, this like that? Uh, you're sharing just a single window, right? Yeah. Yeah. So if you just make it less tall, <laughs> so that's it. Yeah. Go okay. for it. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm right now logged in to the V cluster as the logged in user. So the, the, the really nice thing about this is I'm interacting as me 
Now, if I went back, and I, I don't want to give everybody a headache by switching windows again, but if I go back and I look at the Kubernetes audit logs, it shows that I'm logged in as Mosley to the virtual cluster, all for free. Nice. It's all automated. So I'm actually working with a customer. The end result of this is something I call an ephemeral cluster, where the idea is going to be to create a completely disposable cluster that you never have to debug. So that automation, in addition to the open unison, will deploy an Argo CD. It'll deploy a GitHub instance, link everything up for you securely. And that way, um, if you get to a point where the cluster is irreparably broken, you can time box and say, we're going to spend two hours trying to fix this. Okay, I give up. Nuke it, but it rebuild itself from source. That is very cool. I mean, that's not just namespace as a service, that's an entire cluster as a service. I really like what Loft are doing with vCluster and oh, being yeah. able to hook that in with this like resource request process through Open Unison to give people access to stuff. It's just, it's really awesome. Really, really cool work. And in fact, Thank Russell you. in the chat is saying the same. Uh, the icing on the cake for a great tool. And he's right. Like <laughs> everything we've seen today. It's one of those things that, you know, I, I spin up a lot of clusters. I work with a lot of clusters. Um, and security is the thing that I just always hide and stray from because it's hard. Um, so having tools like this where we can make them the first thing we deploy and get that identity and access problem just done and dusted and out is awesome. So I, I'm Awesome. Thank you. That. I appreciate that. <laughs> that means a lot. Sweet. Um, so any last words, anything you want to share before we finish up today? I think we're going to have to schedule a, a, a part two and do something else together. I, I think we can come up with I'm pretty, in. pretty cool. <laughs> Uh, uh, I've got some interesting ideas for something we can build together. So oh, yeah, definitely, <laughs> man. I want to hear them. Um, my, I, 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 I think everybody's ideas are far better than mine. So I really <laughs> want to hear what, you know, I, I, I love being able to, to take other people's ideas and make them reality. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, hey, I'm really easy to get a hold of um, at MLB. I am on Twitter. Uh, same thing in the uh, Kubernetes Slack. I'm always there. Um, feel free to hit me up with a question. I love answering questions. I love helping people out. Uh, again, I'm going to do the, the shameless self-promotion. <laughs> Amazon, amazon.co.uk. Where is it? There we go. Amazon.co.uk. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's up there. Um, you know, I, I will say that I have been absolutely intimidated by the idea of going on Cluster D. <laughs> It, I see what people pull off and I'm like, yeah, that makes perfect sense. It never would have dawned on me to do that. Um, you know, and I just, I, I would love to, but then people might realize that I'm, 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 I'm a sham. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm more worried that you deploy an open unison into the cluster, deploy in a virtual cluster inside the cluster and set up the local cube config to point to it. Like that's what I'm scared of. <laughs> um, but, uh, um, that, that would be a lot of fun. Uh, what I got to do is I got to see if I can drag um, my partner in crime on the book, Scott Sorovich, on with me um, because he's like, when it comes to, to living with these massive headaches of debugging clusters, he knows it even better than I do, much better than I do. Um, but uh, yeah, but I've had a blast. Thank you so much for doing this and having me on. I'm having a lot of fun and I look forward to having fun doing more stuff. <laughs> no, I really appreciate you taking the time today to kind of walk us through Open News. And it's a super powerful tool. It solves a whole lot, bunch of problems and I hope that a lot of people find this very useful. So uh, thank you very much, Mark, for joining me. Um, I'll reach out to you afterwards. Like I said, I've got ideas. I'm going to talk to you. But until then, definitely have a, a wonderful weekend and I'll catch you soon. You too, David. Adios. Adios.